the pi molecular orbitals of benzene. That's going to be the main focus of this lesson. And before we get there, though, we're actually going to take a look at the molecular orbital diagrams, or what are called frost circles, for how you drive the energy levels uh, for the orbitals in those molecular orbital diagrams for both aromatic and anti-aromatic compounds. And We'll get another reason to see why aromatic compounds are so stable, as well as why anti-aromatic compounds are so unstable. Now, this lesson is part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so before we actually talk about the pi molecular orbitals of benzene, we want to talk about when you've got a, you know, a completely cyclic system that's completely conjugated. So if it ends up either aromatic or anti-aromatic, we want to talk about what its MO diagram might look like. And so turns out there's a method, and often described as what are called frost circles, where you take the polygon of the shape of your aromatic or anti-aromatic system and circumscribe it, or I really should say inscribe it in a circle. Circumscribe the circle around it. One way to look at it. All right, so say you've got benzene here. So if you want to find out uh, anything about the molecular orbitals of benzene, well, first off, we should realize that there are six atoms with a p orbital that are overlapping in this conjugated system. And with six overlapping p orbitals, there are going to be six molecular orbitals. So we saw this back in the last chapter with just uh, open chain uh, conjugated systems and things of this sort. So it's going to work the same way. The number of p orbitals in your conjugated system are going to be equivalent to the number of molecular orbitals on your diagram. So uh, in this case, it turns out if you inscribe the shape, in this case, it'd be a hexagon inside of a circle, and we'll call that a frost circle. So you want to circumscribe it but you want to do it in a special way. You want to circumscribe it in such a way that a vertex points down. If you circumscribe it with a side pointing down, that is not going to fly. So this is how you don't do it with your frost circle. You always have to have a vertex pointing straight down. That's the way it works, not a flat side on the bottom. So, but if you do it this way, it turns out right where every vertex is, is gonna correspond to the energy level of one of the molecular orbitals, just one of the lovely odd coincidences of life here. And so in this case, we can see our molecular orbital diagram is gonna look something like this. And we're gonna have Psi 1, Psi 2, Psi 3, Psi 4, Psi 5, and Psi 6. And the way this works, you kind of got that midpoint line just like we did with conjugated systems in the last chapter. That midline is kind of non-bonding. Anything lower in energy that is going to be bonding. Anything higher in energy that is going to be anti-bonding. So, so what our diagram's looking like in this case, and with benzene, we've got six pi electrons, and so we just fill up the lowest energy orbitals first. So we'll put two there, and then psi two and three are what we call degenerate. You might recall that word. When you have orbitals that are equal in energy, we refer to them as being degenerate. So psi two and three are degenerate, psi four star and five star are also degenerate. So when we go to fill in the next four electrons, We'll give both these one before doubling up. But now we filled in our six pi electrons. And now we can see why benzene is so stable. All six of the pi electrons in benzene lie in bonding molecular orbitals. They're lower in energy than the non-bonding line. So another evidence explaining again why benzene is so stable. Now, if we do this now for the cyclopentadienyl anion, which is also aromatic, so do the same thing. And again, if we're going to uh, inscribe our polygon, in this case a pentagon, inside our circle. Again, you got to do it with a vertex pointing down. So, and again, right where every vertex is, is going to correspond to where the energy levels of the, of the molecular orbitals lie. And once again, we've got some degenerate sets of orbitals. We've got psi 1 right here, psi 2, psi 3, Psi 4 and Psi 5. And the midline really is somewhere right along the middle, right here, above Psi 2 and 3, but below Psi 4 and 5. And that makes Psi 4 and 5 antibonding. So we'll signify that with asterisks. And then Psi 1, 2, and 3 are all bonding molecular orbitals. And in this case, once again, we have six pi electrons. So we'll fill in Psi 1, and then we will also fill in Psi 2 and 3. And once again, all six of our pi electrons lie below the non-bonding line. They're all bond in bonding molecular orbitals. They're all lower energy than non-bonding. And again, explaining why the cyclopentadienyl anion is aromatic and very stable. 
Now we can also use this method to explain why anti-aromatic compounds are unstable. And so we'll take a look at cyclobutadiene here. And cyclobutadiene, again, we'll inscribe our square this time inside a circle. But again, we've got to do it with a vertex pointing down. And again, every vertex in the circle identifies the energy level of one of our molecular orbitals. So in this case, we're going to have our four molecular orbitals. We've got psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3 are degenerate. And then we've got psi 4. Now, in this case, it turns out psi 2 and psi 3 are right on the midline here. And so they're kind of the equivalent of non-bonding. We didn't have that back over here with benzene or the cyclopentadienyl anion. But we do have it with cyclobutadiene. Psi 2 and psi 3, they're not bonding. They're not antibonding. They're right on the midline energy-wise, and they're non-bonding. And then psi 4, then, would be antibonding. We'll signify that with an asterisk. In this case, we've got four pi electrons, 2, 4. And so we'll fill in psi 1. So, but then with two more electrons, we have to give one both to psi 2 and psi 3. And they have to have the same spin, both spin up or both spin down. And now we kind of get a glimpse of why this is so unstable. So first off, all of our pi electrons are not in bonding molecular orbitals anymore. Two of them are actually in non-bonding, which is higher energy. So, but that in and of itself is not going to explain why it's so reactive. So, but the key is we have actually two unpaired electrons. And so if you recall, when you have an unpaired electrons, you are a radical. We talked about radicals being very reactive and things of this sort several chapters back. And well, this is not just a radical, it's a di-radical. It's a double radical. And it is exceptionally reactive. And so we've now got confirmation of why anti-aromatic compounds are so unstable from our molecular orbital diagram. So again, it's a di-radical in non-bonding molecular orbitals. Okay. So this is kind of how this works. For any completely conjugated cyclic system, you just inscribe the polygon in one of these frost circles, and then you can predict, based on where the vertexes are, what the MO diagram is going to look like. Now notice, we haven't actually drawn out any of the molecular orbitals themselves. We just know where the energy levels are going to, draw, or are going to lie. But now we are actually going to draw the molecular orbitals for benzene. Okay, so now when we go to actually draw the molecular orbitals for benzene, it's going to be similar in pattern to how we did this for some of the open chain stuff and our conjugated systems back in the last chapter. And uh, So in this case, we've got six overlapping p orbitals, which is why there's one, two, three, four, five, six molecular orbital diagrams. But in this case, they're cyclic. And so, like, you know, when we did this for like 1,3-butadiene and stuff like that, we drew four p orbitals in a row to kind of represent the overall molecular orbital. Well, in this case, we're going to draw six p orbitals, but not in a row, not in like a, a, a you know a straight chain like we did for one three five hexatriene, but in a ring because it's part of a cyclic conjugated system, and so this is kind of where we're going to start. And one other thing we'll note is the number of vertical nodes. So if you recall, every time uh, you go up in energy, you get another vertical node. And so we saw with like one three butadiene that psi one had zero vertical nodes, psi two had one vertical node, psi three had two vertical nodes, and then psi four had three vertical nodes. Well, here it's again every time you go up in energy, so psi one here is going to have zero vertical nodes, and it's going to be the easiest one to kind of draw here. So because you're going to have constructive overlap all the way around. So no vertical nodes whatsoever. So just constructive overlap all the way around. So that's psi one. It's got no vertical nodes. So, and if you recall, just like we did with the open chain systems in the last chapter, the easiest two molecular orbitals to ever draw are the lowest energy one where everything overlaps, but also the highest energy one where everything alternates all the way around. And that's going to be totally true here as well. I can't quite keep these markers on the board here. All right. So let's just alternate all the way around. All right, so in this thing should have zero, one, two, three vertical nodes. And if you look, we can kind of identify all of them. So there's one right here. So it's not just right here, but it's actually right here. As you cross this line on the entire MO diagram, you switch 
uh, your wave function, the sine of your wave function. So it actually turns out it's right through every one of the bonds. There's another one right here and another one right here as well, all the way across. And there's your three nodes. So our nodes are not just between the adjacent, you know, representations here, the adjacent uh, little kind of P orbital representations we're drawing here. So, but across the entire diagram for it to actually be a node. All right, so now we'll move on to Psi 2 and Psi 3. And these are going to each have to have one vertical node. And one way to pull that off is just to have a vertical node right between the bonds. So keep in mind, those nodes have to be symmetrically distributed. So if you're going to have one node, it has to be right down the middle of your MO diagram. And so in this case, if we draw in our orbital density here. So as long as we don't cross that node, all your wave functions are going to be in phase and match. But once you cross to the other side, you've got to alternate. So keep in mind now that when you've got a node in a cyclic structure, the node has to be through the entire diagram, not just between, you know, two atoms, the, the orbital density on two atoms. So, but right through the entire diagram. And, and once again, I just want to remind you that, uh, again, this is not actually six separate little p orbitals. This is just the way we represent one giant molecular orbital. If you were to draw this thing out, you'd see, uh, you know, electron density on one side and electron density on the other side. And we'd have like a top down view and stuff. But just want to remind you that this is not six little p orbitals, but it's one giant molecular orbital here. So, okay, so that's the first way we can accomplish getting just a single node. Draw uh, a node right down the middle of the molecule through the bonds. But we can also, to get a second example of this, we're going to have to draw it right down the middle, but this time through the atom instead. And so in this case, when we go to draw in our orbital density, we have to skip a couple of them. So a node is a place where there's zero electron density. And when that crosses right through an atom, so we don't draw the orbital representation on that atom because the node cancels it out. The orbital, you know, the, the p orbital we draw here is just a representation of the orbital density on that atom. But if there's a node crossing through that atom, then it doesn't have any orbital density. We saw this with like the allyl cation anion and radical back in the last chapter. And oftentimes to remind us that there's an atom there, but no orbital density, we put a little dot there to, to represent that node. And so if we then draw in our shading here, Again, if you don't cross a node, keep your shading pattern. But once you cross the node, you'll have to alternate to put them out of phase. Cool. And there is Psi 3 also having one node. And again, when that node again lies right across the atoms, that's the one that often throws students just a little bit. Okay. So let's move on to Psi 4 star and Psi 5 star. And in this case, we're going to need two nodes now. And so if we're going to do two nodes, so one of them can be right through the bonds, but one of them here is going to be right through the atom in this particular example. And so if we look once again, so orbital density on these two atoms is canceled out by a node falling right on them. And again, cross the node, you've got to alternate your wave function, cross the node, you've got to alternate your wave function, cross the node, you've got to alternate your wave function. Cool, and there is Psi 4 star. Okay, so let's move on to Psi 5 star here. And once again, we'll draw our nodes. And in this case here, we had one node again through the bonds and one through the atoms. So, but in this one, we're going to have both nodes going through the bonds. So we're not going to cancel out electron density on any of the atoms in this case. All right. So once again, if you don't cross a node, keep them in phase. You molecular orbital's got to match, but once you cross a node, you've got to alternate, cross a node, you've got to alternate. And once again,
cool. And there is Psi 5 star. And now we've actually again drawn the six molecular orbitals of benzene. And again, normally it's Psi 1, 2, and 3 that are occupied. And Psi 2 and 3 could be considered the homo each, if you will. And then Psi 4 star, 5 star, and 6 star are empty under normal conditions. And you could look at Psi 4 star and 5 star as being considered the lumo. Cool. Now here's the deal. We've drawn this out. Just wanted to show that it works exactly the same way. Some of you might be on the hook for being able to reproduce these molecular orbitals, and some of you might not. It really is totally at the discretion of your professor. So uh, if you're not on the hook for drawing this out, fantastic. So, but if you are, that's why we took the time to go through it. So and at the very least, it was very uh, instructive to show, you know, just like we, everything we've seen with uh, linear systems and conjugation and drawing the molecular orbitals, it, all the principles work exactly the same way. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Pretty much the best thing you could do to make sure other students get to see this lesson on YouTube as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems or a final exam rapid review for your OCHEM class, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.